Hello, I'm Morgan Peckland, Editor-in-Chief of City and State. In this episode of Last Look, our guest is City and State columnist Alexis Grinnell. Alexis, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Morgan. Alexis, I want to ask you, how do you choose the topics of your columns? Well, some of it is based on what my editor wants, <laughs> but only loosely. Um, a lot of it actually comes together over the course of the month. Um, I draw from... I have a little idea list, and that is, it can be a quote I read somewhere in the news, it can be a concept I hear, it can be from something I'm reading, um, and then when it's time to actually put the column together, usually a few days in advance, I have all my ideas together, I know what I'm writing about, and then I'm writing. Periodically, it's as only one time that happened, though, I wrote a column on a national topic and got denied by my editor, but mostly I think there's a lot of latitude. And usually it's got to be a news peg, something relevant that's happening, and I like them to also offer something of intrinsic value, and that's a maybe a high watermark to make, and I don't know that I always achieve it, but you know, they've got to say something beyond a simple analysis. They've got to make a larger point, and that's maybe the bigger goal. Are there any columnists or analysts that are uh, particularly inspirational to you that you try to fashion your work after? Um, I think it can be dangerous to try to fashion your work after anyone because then you don't do your own work necessarily. Um, I admire my co-columnist Nicole Galinas very much. I think she puts together some of the most um, persuasive and fact-driven arguments. I also think that Writers like Clyde Haberman, who are just witty, thoughtful, and manage to show without telling too much, offer some of the best writing. So I have a lot of inspiration. It's interesting that you mention Nicole because in a lot of ways she is set up as your ideological counterpoint uh, in the paper. Right. And uh, do you feel that you are persuaded uh, from time to time by oh, yeah. columnists who disagree with you? Absolutely. And actually, uh, Nicole and I once wrote a column on the same topic about the soda ban. Uh, we were on the same side of that issue. We uh, both argued in favor of the mayor's ban on large sugary drinks. And it's interesting to be able to see the arguments that somebody on the other ideological end of the spectrum would make and arrive at the same conclusion. It actually makes your um, arguments stronger and makes you a better debater. And yeah, I, I respect somebody with a different ideology, ideological motivation who can convince me of an argument. Uh, Susan Del Percio, who used to write a column here and who uh, is somebody I admire very grateful, greatly, is somebody else who um, who's writing and um, thoughts I also draw inspiration from. Somebody who is writing on the opposite end of the ideological spectrum is somebody I think I should be reading. It's refreshing to hear you say that, given Absolutely. the partisan divide in our in our city and our state. Absolutely. Um, in terms of your last column, you wrote about Anthony Weiner. Mm -hmm. Anthony Weiner has very much been in the news this week mm -hmm. because he's surging in the polls. Mm -hmm. Do you think that women will be able to ultimately vote for Anthony Weiner? I think that Hillary Clinton learned that women don't vote based solely on gender, and that they, like all voters, are complex beings who vote on a composite of issues. I think that women will vote however they want. I imagine that the polls that the Wall Street Journal and also Quinnipiac show that women were actually uh, a little, I want to say Wall Street Journal, they were a little less likely to vote for Wiener than men. Um, maybe it was the reverse, but um, I think some women will find it a little hard to vote for him and others will have no trouble whatsoever. It's hard to say. You know, we didn't see in the polls that Quinn had some overwhelming advantage with women. We haven't seen Bill Thompson running away with the African-American vote. Mm -mm. Is that because identity politics don't really come into play in the uh, selection of a mayor? Or is that just because we haven't seen the, uh, their identities fully defined yet in the campaign narrative? I would go with the latter. It's a, in some respects also a very weak field and it's very early and we haven't seen the candidates spend any money, really. Uh, we haven't also seen any independent expenditures. and. Unlike in previous campaigns where uh, there was a narrower field, we have a broad array of candidates who are all competing for um, any number of electoral um, pieces of the pie. I think we will see identity politics absolutely come into play as we head closer to Election Day. Uh, identity politics, I think, are alive and well. 
Do you think that this race is going to degenerate into a, a very uh, belligerent, controversial contest? I think we're going to see some independent expenditures earlier than maybe we thought. That Wall Street Journal Maris poll and the Quinnipiac poll showed Wiener uh, probably further along than anyone expected. And as a result, I think uh, either we're going to see some of the other candidates go on the attack and get a little more negative, not Loda, who's of course running as a Republican, but the Democrats in the primary, or we're going to see, and or I should say, some independent expenditures moving up in the schedule, whereas they may have been timed for September or August, maybe drop in July. Seems, Seems like you're saying good. that Anthony Weiner's standing in the polls right now is a reflection of his name recognition. Is Christine Quinn fading in the polls? I think everyone's catching up. Honestly, uh, Weiner has had disproportionate internet press coverage, and nobody's gone negative on him. And as a result, he's somewhat coasted a little bit to the top. Uh, Quinn was at the top when nobody knew anyone else. And as a result, people now know the other candidates a little bit better, and they're catching up with her. I don't know that she's declined so much as everyone else has just moved ahead. We've seen Bill Thompson make a, a slow and steady rise in the polls. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that he's going to continue to build momentum? That's his plan. If you look at him over the six months from January to June, he's just been steady, slow and steady winning the race. And whether or not that wins the race in September is another question entirely. But he's on schedule for what I think is probably his strategy. Bill de Blasio, we have him down as one of our losers of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, and in our explanation, we we're saying that it, it shows that there's not necessarily the best strategy to run to the left in the Democratic primary. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's an accurate evaluation of uh, why Bill de Blasio is struggling? Uh, I think there are a lot of reasons, but there is this broader question of whether or not uh, people want to see the most progressive candidate as their mayor. And uh, whereas New Yorkers certainly identify as progressive and more left-leaning, the question of who, what you need or want in a mayor is a little bit different. And perhaps that broader question about a uh, mayor's ideological leaning is a little less relevant than will the garbage get picked up and will I be able to walk down the street without getting mugged? And uh, perhaps what we're seeing here is that that's less of a factor. Moving on to Albany, uh, we had a very contentious, um, you know, highly watched session. Yep. Who do you think came out on top ultimately uh, in terms of the coalition between the Senate Republicans and the IDC? I think it's very clear that the Senate Republicans were able to run the table at the second half of the session. It started off with a bang for the governor, certainly in the IDC. They won you know, huge victories with gun control measures, the New York Safe Act, as well as minimum wage. And then towards the second half, things sort of took a dive. Um, whereas the IDC all voted for the procedural amendment to move things forward on their kind of key progressive issues, campaign finance reform and the women's equality agenda, they weren't able to get those issues to the floor for a vote. And that's a testament to the Senate Republicans' power. And clearly, they've been able to put the brakes on the governor's agenda. How do you think this bodes for the future of the coalition? Do you think that the coalition will stand going into the next year? Do you think that it will continue to operate the way that it has here uh, up to this point? Well, the Senate Republicans and the IDC are all committed to each other in fundraising and through this mutual, um, this MOU they've signed. And I think the probably the only way that that changes is electorally at the ballot box. Um, and it would have to come through outside efforts. These are senators who are certainly the, in the IDC, generally very popular in their districts. They were able to redraw them in the last redistricting process, and as a result, they're even safer than they might have been before. Um, so I think that that would be certainly a hard sell in some respects, but that's where the change would probably have to happen. The Wall Street Journal had a piece yesterday postulating that what appeared to be a defeat for the governor of the session could actually end up being an electoral victory come 2014. What do you make of that theory? I think there's a big difference between when the governor makes a clean electoral, a, a clean, excuse me, um, legislative victory and when there isn't a legislative victory. When there was no question when the governor won gay marriage or gun control. Uh, this is not that. Uh, that seemed a little bit like wishful thinking to me. Do you think that some of those uh, the issues that got stalled in 2014, campaign finance reform, the women's agenda, will have fresh life in Absolutely. the next session? Absolutely. I think there's a tremendous momentum going into the next session for those issues. They got further than they ever have before, certainly on campaign finance reform. Um, that was an issue that was obscure. 
most people, you know, didn't care, didn't know about it, used to poll below 10 percent. It's polling above 50 percent with, uh, you know, the U.S. Attorney in the Southern and Eastern District promising more indictments. I think corruption will stay in the news and the campaign finance reform advocates, um, if they can continue to tie their agenda to the corruption that is endemic to New York State and certainly in Albany, they will be successful in driving the issue in 2014. Alexis Grinnell, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Morgan.